Well, I want to officially welcome everyone. My name is Samantha Coolish Fargione. I'm the Programs and Educational Coordinator for the Norwalk Historical Society in Norwalk, Connecticut. And our Executive Director, Diane Gellerette, and I would like to welcome you all to this evening's presentation. I quickly looked in the chat and I saw that we have uh, visitors joining us from Kentucky, uh, from um, Uncasville, Connecticut. Uh, so it's always great to see how many people we can pull from all around the country uh, to join us for our virtual lectures. So thank you so much. So before we begin, just a few important reminders. Uh, like I had mentioned, we are going to be recording this lecture tonight, and we will be making it available on the Norwalk Historical Society's website, our YouTube page, and our Facebook page. And we will also email you a copy of the recording um, early next week. We kindly ask that you keep your microphones and your cameras muted and uh, turned off just because we want all of our focus to be on Dr. Darla Shaw this evening. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and we will use the chat feature. So for those of you who found it and, uh, on your screen, fantastic. For those of you who are maybe newly joining us right now, the chat feature is the speech bubble icon. If you're on a desktop or laptop, it's at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you are on an iPad or tablet, it's at the top right corner. You'll click on the three dots and then tap on chat. Uh, so throughout the, the evening, you can type in questions. And at the end of the presentation, um, Diane Gellerette will read the questions out to Dr. Darla Shaw. Now, if you'd like to help the Norwalk Historical Society continue our community programming, please consider making a donation at the end of the lecture this evening. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and you can visit our website, norwalkhistoricalsociety.org, to donate or to become a member. So tonight, we are pleased to host a virtual chat with Mary E. Woolley, activist and educator. Dr. Darla Shaw, Professor Emeritus of Education at Western Connecticut State University, will take on the role of Mary E. Woolley. Now, let's learn a little bit about Dr. Darla Shaw. Uh, she is a Professor Emeritus of Education and Women's Studies at Western Connecticut State University. Uh, she, she's been teaching at WestCon for 25 years. Uh, she taught in the Ridgefield Public School System for 38 years. Her passion is traveling to over 90 countries to provide humanitarian services, playing the accordion and steel drum with three bands, and she loves taking on the roles of numerous historical characters. Uh, last June, Dr. Darla Shaw took on the role of famous suffragist Elsie Hill. Dr. Shaw also speaks and writes about her experiences with cancer for Anne's Place, the American Cancer Society, and Sloan Kettering. So now uh, we are going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Shaw, who will become Mary E. Woolley. Thank you so much, and welcome, everyone. I am so glad to be here. I am Mary E. Woolley. Now, my mother's name was Mary a woolly so that can be very confusing so my family and friends they just called me may now i was born way back in 1863 in south norwalk oh i love south norwalk south norwalk south hadley they were the two places that i consider my home now, before tonight, you probably have never heard of my name. Well, I did a few things, so I'd just like to highlight quickly, and I'll go in more detail. I was the first woman to go to Brown and graduate. I was the first woman who was in charge of the college boards, Phi Beta Kappa, AAUP, the Association for Women. I was the very first woman to ever get an honorary degree. This one was from Amherst. I also got one from Yale. I 
was very, very proud. I was the very first woman under three different presidents to be an advocate and a delegate in connect condition with peace movements. I was such a peace activist as well of a person in higher education. Well, that's a little bit about my first because I was born the mid 1800s when women weren't doing that much, we couldn't, I was able to be first in a number of different arenas. But I wanna tell you about my connection with Norwalk, particularly South Norwalk, which we called Old Wells back then. Well, back in the 1600s, my relatives on my mother's side, the Ferrises began to immigrate from England. Now, my great grandfather was Benjamin and oh, he got this huge land grant, Stanford, Greenwich, and Norwalk, and he moved here and settled. He turned the land over to Gould, who was my great-grandfather, and then the land was turned over to my grandfather, who was Stephen. Now, Stephen married Abigail, and from the union between Stephen and Abigail, my mother, Mary A. Woolley, was born. Her name was Ferris then, she married Joseph Woolley. Now, my father, he was also from England, but they didn't immigrate here very early on. Instead, his family went to the island of Jamaica. They were very big and wealthy plantation owners. Sugar cane they grew. They also had lots of slaves. Oh, my father was so against slavery, and that was handed down to me. So anyway, what happened is that um, when I was born, I was born on West Avenue in this most beautiful house. And I want to tell you about this house because I loved this house so much. Well, right now it's way out of the city. Back then, uh, now, I mean, it would be just the reverse. Well, it had lawns, gorgeous lawns. I mean, and they rolled down terraces down to the street. And I used to have my pinafores and with my friends, I'd roll down and my mother would get so mad. And she would say, Mary, I told you, you can't roll down. Look at those grass stains on your pinafore. There were, oh, all kind of trees, apple trees and crab apple and willows and elms. The yard was absolutely beautiful. The house was huge enough for two families. So that's why when I was born, my parents moved in for about the first five years of my life. Oh, the house looked like a plantation house. It had big columns huge porch with swings and on rainy days I was always out on the porch. It started out as two stories and then they added another story and this most amazing turret house and there was a spyglass in the turret house and I would look out to the harbor and I would watch these clipper ships come in. It was so amazing. The inside of the house was magnificent. It was all Wayne's coat and those beautiful little crystal doorknobs. And the windows were 12 little panes everywhere. There were windows everywhere. There were fireplaces everywhere. Oh, the best part of this house, I will never forget. Not one attic, two attics separate in each attic trunks full of fabulous costumes and stuff and pictures. And my friends would come over and say, Mary, can we go to Attic 1? Let's go to Attic 2 today. It was such a wonderful house. I never really left the house because when my family did move to Meriden, I always came back for every single holiday to be with my grandparents. And in the summer, where did I go? 
I came to stay in so South Norwalk for 30 years with my grandparents. It was such a wonderful, wonderful place. My father was absolutely incredible. He was tall, he was thin, he was smart, he was charismatic, he was sincere, he was so empathetic. And he's the only man I ever knew. He would go up steps three at a time. They even called him Father Wooly. He wasn't a Catholic priest, but he did so much for everyone. Well, his family, when they finally did come from Jamaica to America, they went to Ridgefield. And he went to Yale, he became a minister. He started ministering in a church in Ridgefield. He had a better opportunity here in South Norwalk. So he came to South Norwalk and lo and behold, who is in his parish? My mother. Well, they fell in love, they married, they had three children. I was the oldest. My father also said very honestly, I was the most like him. I was the smartest, I was the most organized, but I was also the bossiest. But that was part of my leadership skills I used to tell everyone. With growing up, um, we moved next to Meriden. I was in first grade. I hated to leave South Norwalk, but I went with my family to Meriden. Now, while my father was in Meriden, the Civil War took place. He signed on as a chaplain for a number of different regiments, but he was so much more than just a minister during the war. He also learned to be a medic so he could help the doctors so much in need. Also throughout his life, he was a social worker. He was not just a minister, he helped everyone with any problem that they had. Well, while my father was working as a chaplain in the Civil War, I was named daughter of the regiment. This gave me opportunity to read to speak just like I did when my father was a minister in a church. This certainly helped my speaking, organizational and leadership skills. We moved again when I was in high school. Now we went to Pawtucket, Rhode Island. I graduated number one in my class, student council president, president of all the clubs, good athlete, I went on to Wheaton. Wheaton was a girls' school. It had very domestic type of courses. I loved it there. It was not that challenging. It was a seminary. It later became Wheaton College. When I graduated, they offered me a job. And so I taught there for a couple of years. This certainly was not going to be where I was going to stay. Well, after about two years teaching at this school, I saved enough money and I went with my friend from Wellesley, my friend from Smith, and we traveled all over the British Isles. Oh, what a trip. The best part of the trip, we went to Oxford. I said, now this is what I wanna do. I wanna go to Oxford and get my master's. Well, I came home, told my parents, wanna go to Oxford. They said, that is a great idea. And they were so supportive of this. But in my life, a lot of things happened at dinner parties. And this was one of those dinner party incidents. Well, right after that, my father's friend who was head of the math department at Brown happened to come for dinner. And he said to me, Mary, I heard about your trip. And, you know, and what are your plans for the future? And I said, well, I'm applying to Oxford for my master's. And this man said, oh, that's good. Uh, I might have another alternative for you. And I said, I'm listening. And he said, well, Brown University, 130 years, no women. We're thinking it might be a good time to take in a few women, maybe five or six. And I think with your background, you're smart, you're quick, you're organized, you have leadership skills. I think 
it might be good if you apply. I can certainly write a recommendation for you. I applied to Brown. I was accepted to Brown with five other women, all very strong women academically and leadership wise. Unfortunately, only three of us graduated with our masters. Oh, I loved Brown. The curriculum, the science, the math, the global issues, the politics. Oh, so different from going to Wheaton. This was the school I needed to be. The courses were tough. Oh, that wasn't the tough part. Dealing with the men at Brown, they didn't want women there. I mean, there were girls colleges all over the place and they believed women belonged at home, in the kitchen with the children. What were we doing in classes with them, competing with them? They were not happy. They were not nice to us at all. And they particularly disliked me. I probably asked more questions than anyone else. I answered more questions with all kind of proof. I volunteered for every activity. I did more research than everyone else. I gave more lectures than anyone else. Well, it was quite an experience there and I did graduate. I did get an honorary degree later on, a doctorate from Brown and I even got the Rosenberg Award. It was the first women, this is a award that was given to people like Rockefeller and to the head of the United States Supreme Court. Now, when it came time to graduate, we presented our thesis. My thesis was on the United States Post Office. There had never been thorough research on this before. My research was so detailed. It was immediately picked up and published by a well-known publishing company. Well, the men at Brown were not happy about this either, as most of them had no offers for publication. After Brown, I was asked, did I want to teach there? I thought about it. But at the same time, Wellesley came knocking at my door and said, we followed you. We followed you through Wheaton. We followed you through Brown. And we would like you to come and teach at Wellesley. I thought, I am tired of fighting the men at Brown. Let me go to Wellesley. I had majored before in religion, Bible, linguistics, literature, and this type of thing. And this is what I taught when I was at Wellesley. Now, what happens is you always start at the college level. You start as a lecturer. Then you work very hard to fulfill these requirements five or six years. You go up to the next level. Then five or six more years, you get to the professor level and so on. After my first year, I was moved up to associate professor. The next year after that, not five or six years, I was promoted and I became a full professor. Two years after that, I became head of my department. I was in my late 20s. This was absolutely unheard of, but why? It's because I put every ounce of energy into everything that I did. And I didn't teach like anyone else. I didn't lecture, give tests, that type of thing, no. It was all engagement, interaction. And what I would do is have discussion groups, study groups, research groups. We would go out in the community. We would make it practical. We had debates. We had mock trials. We did things in play format. It was a different form of teaching, teaching like we have today. And that's what people were interested in who were looking ahead and had a vision. Also at Wellesley, something very important happened to me. I met Jeanette Marks. 
Jeanette was 10 years younger. She was a student. We were just friends at that time, but we had so much in common. Later on in life, when 10 years did not make a difference, we met up again and we became soulmates and we were together for the rest of our lives. And this wonderful woman was with me in my most handicapped stages later on in life. And now another dinner party comes along. This time, my family and I are invited to a dinner party and there is a person from the board of trustees at Mount Holyoke. And he is asking me about what I have been doing at Brown and also at Wellesley. And he said to me, you know, we might be interested in you at Mount Holyoke. I said, I'm listening. I thought, my goodness, it might be a bigger department. The next step would be possibly a dean, but I don't think so. He said, would you mind if we have three people come for a couple of days? We want to see you because you work, we know, as an RA in the dorm. We know you give religious classes, your discussion groups. You know, we want to see everything that you do, your work in the community, all the different classes you teach. I said, fine, no problem. The people came. They observed. I didn't see any reaction except thank you. In two weeks, I get a letter. And it says, you are one of three finalists for president of Mount Holyoke. What? How can this be? It's got to be a mistake. I'm just going to be turning 30. I have never gone to Mount Holyoke. They've never had a president that doesn't come from the school. I don't have my doctor's degree. There's got to be some mistake. But no, they interviewed me and interviewed me and interviewed me. Every population you could think of. I probably asked more questions than they even asked me. Two weeks later, I was told that I was going to be the 11th president of Mount Holyoke. I was the youngest college president at that time ever. And I was in this job for almost 40 years, which is just about unheard of. Well, when I was initiated as president of Mount Holyoke, it was three days, it was like a coronation. I will never forget it. Blue and white flowers and banners and posters, constant serenades, parades, symphony, theater groups, sporting groups, debates, there's breakfast and luncheons and dinners and teas and speeches. Oh, I'm so glad that my father was able to come to most of these events and offer the prayer. I wanted my parents to be there for this most wonderful event ever. This is so interesting too. I fell in love immediately with Dr. Hooker. She was head of the biology department. She raised rare chickens. From the day I entered to the day I retired, I received special eggs from these chickens. And she provided me with my first mascot, my pet chicken that followed me all over campus. I always loved collie dogs. My collie dogs were there, but they were right up there with my prize chicken. I loved Mount Holyoke. I took part in everything. I sang with the choir. I was in the plays, but I said, please, please don't give me a big part. I don't have time to memorize all of this, you know. I took part in the Red Cross programs. I took part in the community programs. I taught one class 
what college president actually teaches classes. I did, as I said, discussion groups, religious groups. When there was a field trip, I was there. If we traveled abroad, I was there. It was seven days a week, 12 hours a day, but this was my life. I did also speak on many different occasions all over. I can't tell you how many times I came back to Norwalk to speak, but I do have one letter right here where right when I was inaugurated as the president of Mount Holyoke was when they wanted me to come and speak in South Norwalk and I wasn't able to do it, but I came here so many times. I spoke on women's rights, children's rights, being a peace activist and on higher education. I made so many changes to the university, so many that were the first that have been taken over by other universities. When I came to Mount Holyoke, the students here had to cook and clean and do all kinds of domestic things. I said, no, 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 you need to research. You need to study. We need different type of courses. I got rid of so many of the home ec type of courses. I wanted a brown curriculum for these women and this is what they got. I had the highest level math, the highest level science. As I said, I had governmental courses, I had classical courses, every type of language you could imagine. I started a master's program. I was working on a doctoral program. I had work study, I had internships, I had shadowing. Um, I had junior year abroad. People didn't do that type of thing. I linked to other universities in the area so you wouldn't only have to go to Wellesley. Um, I brought in students from all different ethnic groups. I expanded the scholarship program. The endowments went from like 50,000 to 500,000 in a very short period of time. The buildings began to grow. The dorms were wonderful. There were so many things that needed to be done at Women's University. And I think we served as a role model for that. I think I was diplomatic and I wanna tell you two brief stories. My mother was the one with the diplomacy and I learned that from her. At one time, McKinley's daughter had graduated from Mount Holyoke. They invited her father to come and speak. And when he came, they thought they needed special dishes for him. I don't know why, but that's what they did. And they had a cabinet after he ate on these dishes, they put him in a cabinet. And this one girl later on decided, wouldn't it be funny if she somehow figured out how to get in these cabinets, steal the McKinley dishes and put in a fake one? Well, she didn't say anything for a while. And then of course she had to tell somebody. So everyone was waiting for me to expel her and make a big deal out of this. So I called her into my office and I said, bring the McKinley dish. She came in with her McKinley dish and uh, she said, I know you're gonna expel me. I said, no, 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 I'm not gonna expel you. Give me the dish, we're gonna put it in this drawer here and you're gonna put it back in the case when you graduate. And she said, I'm gonna graduate. I said, yeah, you're gonna graduate with honors. And you definitely wanted recognition. This is why you did this. So you're gonna get recognition, but in a different way. You are gonna go out into the community. You are going to find what the community needs. You are gonna use students here on campus and you are gonna make a difference. The girl went out into the community. There were a lot of textile factories around. She found that the women and the children and some of the men wanted help. They couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't do math. For a year, three hours after school, after work, every day, she had groups of people rotating, overseeing, mentoring and tutoring for these people. She not only got recognition, 
at Mount Holyoke. She got recognition from the state. There was another woman and she told everybody that she was gonna take me on. She said, you know, Mount Holyoke is this cookie cutter place. Everyone has to look alike, act alike, talk alike. There's no differences. And I'm going to take the president to task. Well, of course I heard about this because I had my ear to the ground. So instead of giving my regular lecture at the time, I decided mm, I'll bring in eight different girls, all extremely different, all doing different things as far from cookie cutter as you could get. They came in and they spoke. I said, anyone have questions, comments? She raised her hand. I said, yes. I waited, nothing. I said, do you have something to say? Nothing. Finally, she said, you've answered my questions. Case closed. I never heard from her. I was not a reactionary. I tried to be diplomatic and low key as far as this. When I was at Mount Holyoke, I was doing many, many other things. And I've often said to people, there is not an acronym that I know of I don't like and work for. Well, as I said to you, AAUW, I was in charge of many branches of that. Pi Beta Kappa, that was one of my first things, the college boards, anything to do with higher education. I was there promoting it. Now, I was also very big in the LWB, League of Women Voters. Carrie Chapman, Cat. Oh, were we good friends? Did we work together to get women the right to vote and other equal opportunities? Jane Adams, I worked with her tirelessly. Then, of course, children, children's issue. There were children working in factories. Children needed special health care. Children needed early education. There were so many issues with child brutality from the parents. These I worked on endlessly as well. My father was against slavery. My father was a civil rights activist. I also, ACLU, NAACP, fighting for all the rights for people in marginalized groups. I was also extremely active at all times of my life in the Red Cross. And I was a delegate for the United Nation. But I think probably after being in higher education, my biggest draw was being a peace activist. I would do anything to promote peace. And I traveled extensively coming up with bylaws and plans and programs. I worked under three different presidents on peace initiatives, Hoover, Coolidge, and Roosevelt. This was such an important area for me, and I was so thrilled when I was asked to go speak and be a delegate at the Geneva Peace Conference. This was such a powerful effort, and who did they sit me next to? Will Rogers. I have never had more fun in my whole life than sitting next to Will Rogers. And he said to me, you know, Mary, he said, I thought you'd be a stodgy old intellect and you're so much fun. He said, you know, Mary, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm going to be 70. So, well, you know, you're about the same age as I am. He said, you know, most women don't tell their age. And I said to him, you know, age is a fact. It's not a mystery. And then he challenged me to running up 70 steps at age 70 to see who could run faster. And I said, I know I can, we don't even have to do the challenge. And he said, you probably could, we'll forget about that. Yes, there were so many things. There was also the National Conservation Preservation League and this gave me great, great pride. There was an actress from Weston Eva Lagali, she was a conservationist, a president. She gave so much land to Weston. She was such a strong activist 
and I was able to give her an honorary degree. I was also a big name in the YMCA. I fought for women having equal facilities to the men and their YMCA. After almost 40 years, I decided it's time to retire. I was having like mini strokes. My health was failing. I couldn't see. I had my wonderful friend, Jeanette, and we had the most beautiful home on Lake Champlain in Westport, New York. And that's where we retired. And from my wheelchair, I wrote. Remember, I wrote the book on the post office. I wrote a book that was a tribute to my father. And there's Jeanette and there's our colleagues. We were very happy. She would take me in a special van. I would still speak. I did research. I did all that I possibly could. Well, my one regret. My big regret in life, and probably the only one, and I had nothing to do with it, was what happened at Mount Holyoke. After I left, of course, they got a new president. It was a political appointee. I had nothing to do with it. But what he did, everything I had worked so hard for, globally, work study, women having tougher courses, not having home ec type courses. He did away with it. In a year and a half, it was almost back in so many cases to day one before I came. Oh my God, this broke my heart. I never went back to Mount Holyoke after this man was there. Did I get honors? Oh, I got a lot of honors. So I said I was the first one to get an honorary degree from Amherst. And I ended up getting over 20 honorary degrees. Many of them were from Ivy League, some were for community college, it didn't matter. I had this closet, I love this closet. Every time I got a new robe and a new hood, I would put it in order, they each had a number. So when I spoke, whether it was in a wheelchair or standing up, I would use this robe, I put it to the back, then the next one would move up. I rotated continually all of my hoods and robes. I was also uh, given the honor of having a dorm named after me at Pembroke College. A Mount Holyoke graduate was Frances Perkins, who was the first Secretary of Labor, a woman no less. And she always spoke about me. And she said, one of the women I admire most, she had her pulse on what women are all about, was Mary Woolley. I admired her so much, I never realized how much she admired me. And that same year, Good Housekeeping gave me a award as one of the 10 most important women in the decade of the 1930s. Now I'm going to end this and I wanted to tell you a little bit about four things that I used to tell my students. I didn't realize I was telling them this until they kind of made fun of me. Well, the very first thing that I would say is, ladies, it's all about the brain. Your brain is just as good as any man's. Now, if somebody tells you to pull a locomotive, you may not be able to pull that locomotive as well as a man, but I don't think anyone's going to ever ask you to do that. Now, secondly, these were my bullhorns. And I would say, you know, ladies, people have always said to me, Mary, you are a bull in a china shop. I didn't think this was bad. They didn't call me a cow because we as women, we're not gonna compete as much with other women. We need to show we have everything that a man does. And then people would go like this and they'd lean to the side. And what I would say to them, that's the leaning tower of Pisa. You do not wanna be the leaning tower of Pisa because that tower, did not have a good base. 
It did not have a strong structure. You need a strong base, religion, your family and friends, boy, your education and your community. And last of all, I would say to them, remember the power of one. Everything starts with one person. You need to plan, you need a purpose, and you need your passion. And these things will get you where you want to go. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope that now, maybe for the first time, Mary Woolley, 11th president of Mount Holyoke, will have some meaning for you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, one comment we were going to make, um, there was a picture of a house. Did we put the picture of the house up? Uh, we're not certain and don't think it was actually the grandparents' house, but it was very similar. We think it was uh, maybe a relative. It did have the pillars and it had the lawn, then the turret and the three stories and was typical of the time period. But we don't want anyone to think or go looking for that house because we don't think we tried very hard to find the house and we don't think it's there anymore. Right. I, I didn't put the house in the slideshow. Oh, oh. It, the house that we found, it was of a Ferris family member, but we don't think it was the house of Stephen Ferris, who, like you said, was uh, Mary Woolley's grandfather. Um, yeah. yeah, sadly, we, we don't have an image or an image that I know of, um, of Stephen Ferris's house. Um, but, um, but you never know. <laughs> Photos sometimes turn up. <laughs> Any questions? I'm sure there was a wonderful presentation. Just want to let you know that uh, she was a, a woman ahead of her time. Um, oh, so <laughs> far ahead of her time. Yeah. I, I think like when I said when she talked about her global programs, her community service, her mentoring, these things, um, the colleges did not have these back in the early 1900s. She initiated them. And that's why when a man came and took them away after she worked so hard, really bothered her. Yeah, it wouldn't bother anyone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, someone's congratulating you on uh, what a wonderful presentation. Thank um, you so much. Yes, you got to take this on the, on the road, uh, road again. Okay, Mount, uh, who, there was someone from Mount Holyoke. I'd love to hear from them. Did somebody? Yeah, yeah there's an alumna from uh, Mount Oh, Holyoke. she was, um, the family, somebody asked about L-E-I-C, -E I can't remember, Lichenchister or something like that she was from. L-E, I, I, I can't remember offhand, but in the information, it does talk about where her family was from in England. And she did travel back many times. She did not ever go to Oxford. Life came up, so she was so busy that she never went back to Oxford. She thought about it, but her health prevented her, yes. Uh, there's a question. Why did he take it all away? <laughs> the, he had, um, as I said, from, from what I could, you know, infer, it was sort of a political appointment, a man who didn't really understand where women were going, their vision, and so on. And he thought that, you know, this is not how women should be trained or taught at the time. Um, the other question, was she gay? Yeah, she had, um, right, they didn't talk about it at the time, if you read, she had a significant other. And one of the reasons, um, well, the, the man who took over after her also made a big deal of continually saying, now you have somebody 
who is president of Mount Holyoke, who has a regular family and a regular marriage and is not living with a woman. So he always threw it up in her face as well. But they had a wonderful relationship for, I think, 40 some years. Yeah, that, that was unusual at the time. Oh, um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see, there's a ham hall on, on Mount Holyoke campus, and there is a, but the Mary Woolley Hall is bigger. <laughs> is that true? It's, I couldn't hear you. Okay, there's a ham hall on, uh, at Mount Holyoke campus. Ham hall? I, I, ham I, hall. I, quite honestly, ham I've hall. never been on Mount Holyoke. <laughs> campus i didn't look door. anything at the uh is there something significant because tell us i'd love to hear from the person from mount holyoke i'm a i'm a mount holyoke alum okay ham hall is a recent more recent building mary woolley hall is the central focus of the campus it it has an auditorium a stage um and the many offices are located there and when I was a student, I'm class of 56. When I was a student, the basement was called Wilder. Uh, yes, um, yes. That's not right, it starts with a W. It's not Wilder, Wilder's a dorm. Um, anyway, it was the social hall. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the radio station, the, the college radio station, which is the oldest continuing operating radio station entirely run by women, was also wow. in mm -hmm. the basement of Mary Woolley Hall. And it's, it's still heavily used. Alumni offices are there now, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Yes. Wow. And, Very interesting, yeah. And I never knew that Mary Woolley didn't go to Mount Holyoke. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> nope. And, and this surprised her that they would even consider her for this and at such a young age. And she didn't have her doctorate because, you know, most of the college presidents were in their late 50s, 60s, and 70s at the time. So I'm also an alum. Um, I graduated in 74. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah. Ask a question. I don't have a question. I've just been oh. writing comments. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, now, what from what I've researched is that, of course, Mary Lyon was the first and the most amazing lady, and that Mary Woolley, probably after her, was the one that made the most changes, was the most dynamic, and stayed there the longest. Yeah. I have no idea that um, Dr. Ham had made all of those changes, because what you were describing Mary Woolley accomplishing is the Mount right. Holyoke I remember. And yeah. so well, I who, didn't realize it went back. Well, who was president when you were there? Oh, um, a man. He didn't have long tenure, David somebody. Oh, from, from Yale. Well, he's the one who's at who's no, not get not home. get out home. <laughs> Well, um, from what I, I, I gathered was Mary did not have any problem with a man being a president if the man was qualified. But she, you know what I mean? Um, there, there wasn't a lot of discussion. He made major changes and then he left so quickly, um, you know, and, and, and but I felt badly that she never went back. You know, yeah. she never really had any closure, but there was such bitterness about him taking away so many of her programs that she couldn't. I was a okay. student. I was a student when he was Roswell Graham was president. Yeah. Oh, the, okay. Oh, I just remembered the name of the fellow in the early seventies was David Truman. Right. And oh, oh. Um, very interesting. Yeah. This is wonderful to have. Uh, some alumni on here. Right, and isn't this exciting? Wonderful. I think that's, awesome. I love that. Yeah. Nancy Wilder is also an alum. She's here. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. We have three people. That's great. Did, Nancy, did you have a comment to make? She's muted. Okay. She, she can unmute. There she comes. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, I, I entered Mount Holyoke in 1945, 
And I remember um, I was an English lit major and President Ham taught a Shakespeare course that I took. And I remember him quite fondly. I, I don't remember uh, these changes. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, there, there were no domestic things that we were involved yeah. in at all or anything. So uh, I, I thought quite well of him. Yeah. So I was Why? not, Thank you. not Thank you. aware of of uh, the changes you're talking about. Yep. Why would the trustees or the other powers that be allow him to go backwards and change all those things? Did they not like what the college had become? Because he can't have been the sole decision maker. Oh, on, I, you on know, I, uh, this was more or less from, from what I read was from her point of view so you know and she said and I said it was political and I know he didn't stay that long and um and I, she was so bitter that it could have cloud you know what I mean who knows what really came down because once she left she never really talked about the board of Tr anything you know she really just went up to Westport New York did her writing, research, and speaking mostly on the peace movement and that type of thing, and really, you know, didn't have anything to do with Mount Holyoke after that. So, I mean, I was reading more from her bitterness, but like, as you said, you always have to look at two sides of a question. And so I was doing it more from her point of view. I, I don't know anything about him. Yeah. I so you should have you should have stayed at Wellesley because I'm a Wellesley alum and we've only had women presidents. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, she was very much she was very much for you know even because she had been allowed as the first woman group into Brown, so she was not against having men come into Mount Holyoke either. And she was not against the right person. And, you know, you don't expect everything to stay the same. There's always going to be changes. But in such a short period of time to change so much, this really bothered her. Mm. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dr. Shaw. And thank you, audience, for uh, participating. Uh, I think this has been a great conversation. And uh, I think we all learned, learned something uh, today. Um, thank you for supporting the Norwalk Historical Society. And I uh, hope you'll uh, uh, join us again uh, for some of the other um, things that we're, we're actually doing. Um, and if you're in the area, uh, come visit us at uh, Mill Hill. Uh, we're having self-guided tours this weekend. Um, and at the end of the month, uh, June 27th, we're having that, of course, so you can uh, go back in time at Mill Hill. Uh, so thank you. Um, and everyone, have a wonderful evening.